Yeah, thank you very much, Joris. Um, thank you for having me. Um, welcome, everybody. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dan. I'm a postdoc at University of Calgary as part of the Chile Slope Systems Consortium. Today, we're talking to you about how we can link midpoint morphodynamic processes to the rock record of submarine channel fills. That's strange. So let's begin with rivers. With rivers, we can use uh, remote sensing, so things like satellite data, aerial photography, or even field mapping techniques to observe how they evolve in time and what are their morphological controls on their evolution. And from this, we can see that bar forms, and in particular in this case, point bars, are a strong control on their morphological evolution. This creates lateral accreting packages in uh, deposits, and this translates into the rock record and into stratigraphy, as we can see here from the Pisces, Mississippi. One of the other nice things about rivers is that we can go and visit them and, and sample them and to test these models and link the processes that are occurring within their channels themselves to the stratigraphic record so we can verify these models. When it comes to submarine channels, we do not have this luxury as they are much more challenging to access and, and monitor. And therefore, because of their plan form similarity, it's often quite tempting to apply these fluvial models to what we see in submarine channels. When it comes to the outcrops of, of such systems, we can see that the, um, I'll just switch to the pointer. We can see that the uh, river systems are dominated again by these laterally accreting bodies. However, in the case of submarine channels, we can see that they're actually, the submarine channels are dominated by these cut and fill packages. So these cuts and fills and cuts and fills, which overlie and are sub parallel to this, these primary erosion surfaces and are broadly oriented up and down around the channel center line. So in most cases, the lateral accretion models do not tend to fit what we see in the stratigraphic record of submarine channel fills. So where did nick points come into this? So nick points are these steep stepped and channel gradients, and they've been recognized as a strong control on the evolution of channel morphology. And that is in part due to their ability to migrate upstream on the orders of hundreds of meters per year, so nick point one here migrates about three and a half kilometers upstream over these 10 years. When this occurs, we get erosion at the head of the nick point, so here in red, and deposition downstream of the nick point, so down here in yellow. These erosion and depositional uh, packages have been recognized in the rock record from shallow seismic, so for example, Dan Tech's paper here. So we can link erosion and, and nick point decisional surfaces and as they migrate upstream, we can see that they then filled with this genetic related sediment. So the question we want to ask going forward is, are nick points capable of creating these fundamental building blocks of submarine channel fill? So these kind of full packages that we see at a meter scale and, and are they able to do that? So I'll talk to you about two main study areas today. The first being the uh, Magallanes Basin in Southern Chile. And the stratigraphic context we have here is the, the light green color here is the um, shallow marine and deltaic Dorotea formation. And then in the gray, we have the genetically linked uh, slope clinotherms and clinoforms of the trace passus formation. And these yellow colors here are slope channels. And I'll mention today Alves Ridge, and I'll very briefly mention Lagoon Figueroa. So why Alves Ridge? Alvarez Ridge is a north-south trending outcrop with a series of cliff faces that are uh, marked by these dotted lines we can see here. And Ben Daniels spent a lot of time in his master's thesis reconstructing how the about 20 or so channel elements interact with these cliff faces um, based on around 900 paleofoil measurements and their faces and architectural uh, intersections with the cliff faces. And what he saw is that the channels are broadly parallel to sub-parallel to the outcrop trend. So we're getting a predominantly down dip perspective of these channel fills. And today I will talk mostly about channel element two and channel element four, which most parallel the outcrop trend. And not examples such as number six here, which enter the outcrop trend at a relatively steep angle. I very briefly want to mention Laguna Figueroa. Um, Although it, uh, the channels enter here at a highly oblique outcrop angle, so actual longitudinal lateral measurements are a bit more challenging, what we do have are nice axis to margin transitions, which enable us to look at the faces and also depths of incision and thicknesses of these 
uh, code and code packages within the channel bodies themselves. The second main study Ariel mentioned is Butinlet. Butinlet is a fjord located to the northwest of Vancouver in British Columbia, Canada. And the fjord has been, oh, sorry, the fjord hosts a uh, 40 kilometer long or so submarine channel within it. And within the fjord, there are three nick points. So there's nick point three, uh, which is the most distal, nick point two, which is up here, and then the second survey over here as well, and then nick point one. And the fjord has been documented using seven uh, multiple repeat bathymetric surveys. And we're going to use seven of them in this study between 2008 and 2018. And this enables us to track uh, changes in the geomorphology of the C4, air deposits within it, and where the, the nick points are in, in or between any or all the surveys. So let's return to the stratigraphic record. So again, we have this nice example from uh, Laguna Figueroa here of this uh, channel element, which has a primary incision surface here in red. And then the fill of this channel element is dominated by these curtain fill and curtain fill packages, which are often called channel stories. This juxtaposes these younger deposits on top of older deposits in the channel margin over here. So our nick points capable of creating such geometries at the meter scale. This is a cross section of the, of the submarine channel in Butinlet. And we can see here how there's primarily deposition between 2008 and 2010 in the channel Thalweg. Between 2010 and 2014, a nick point migrated upstream through this area and incised into the channel by about 10 meters and stranded the previous Thalweg deposits in a new channel margin position. Then from 2014 to 2018, the nick point migrated upstream and began to fill the conduit with genetically related sediment, giving us a cut followed by a fill. So in the situation where we have a nick point that migrates upstream from T1 to T2, incising into the substrate, as we see here, and beginning to fill the, the, the incision surface with sediment as it moves upstream. When we think about submarine channel fill models, we often think of these nice uh, margin to axis models and the cases and architectures that go along with that. And we often think of the, the channel axes as being, these, as being dominated by structural sandstones and being relatively homogenous. But is that really the case? So what I'm showing you now is an interpretation of the Alves Ridge cliff faces using a drone model that enabled us to get a much better perspective of these cliffs that, we're, that, that we were unable to do so in the fields. We can't climb up them. Um, and what this enables us to do is to see that the architecture of these channel axes longitudinally is highly compartmentalized and consists of a lot of discontinuous wedges and lenses of sediment or, or deposits. And this suggests that the uh, locus of erosion and deposition within these systems is not fixed um, longitudinally, so it's moving uh, up and down or backwards and forwards through time. So how does this compare with what we see in View Inlet? So here in View Inlet, we can see that we have these upstream migrating like scale features that are similar to what we can see here on the right of this figure. And again, we can start seeing these discontinuous wedges and lenses of sediment, similar to examples that we're seeing here in the ancient example. And again, I just want to emphasize that we're seeing these discontinuous uh, bodies and it suggests that the and the locus of erosion and deposition is shifting through time backwards and forwards. So how do the scales of these systems compare? Are we comparing, say, apples to elephants in this case? These two boxes are at different vertical exaggerations, so um, are these actually the same approximate scales? So to quantify this, we wanted to, to pull out some measurements from these different systems. We started by measuring the, the thicknesses of these curtain fill packages. So first of all, we measured the four element thicknesses of the current of the channel elements in Laguna Figueroa, and also these current fill packages that make up the stratigraphy there. So these um, these channel stories are they're often called. We also measured these current fill packages in View Dinlet, and what we can see is that the channel elements are predictably much thicker than these current fill packages in both uh, cases. However, uh, when we look at the channel stories and these cut and fill packages in Butte Inlet, we can see that they're occurring at broadly the same scale on the orders of about four to nine meters. So both both occurring these, these meter or to 10 meter or so cut and fill packages. So 
certainly similar scales, which is good to see. We see the same thing when it comes to measuring the thicknesses of these downstream oriented bodies, again, occurring at meters or so scale. However, the big contrast comes when we look at the lengths of these bodies, where the Butte Inlet bodies are much longer than what we see in Alvarez Ridge, which may seem a bit problematic. However, there's a, probably a quite a, a simple explanation for that, which is time, in that the bodies in Alvarez Ridge have been reworked through multiple, over hundreds to maybe thousands of years by multiple nick points. So therefore, they've been had much more chance to be eroded and reshaped. In contrast, the deposits we see in Buer Inlet are related to only one nick point over the 10 years of uh, measurements that we have, and so have yet to be reworked by subsequent nick points. And we can see here how even this small nick point on the right is beginning to incise into and erode into these younger deposits at the top and shorten them. So therefore, if with subsequent reworking by further nick points, we'd expect these deposits to be further compartmentalized and the Butte Inlet bodies to converge on the lengths of what we see in Alvarez Ridge. Two minutes then. Yep, just wrapping up, thanks. Um, so we can start to conclude this and, and think of a model and why it might matter. So we have a, we can predict a simple model of how nick points can shape the, the deposits of, of submarine channel fills, and that is we have a headward incision that creates a cut into the, pre, the underlying substrate. And as the nick point migrates upstream, we begin to fill that incision surface with sediment giving us a cut and a fill. And as the nick point migrates upstream, we get a longitudinally variable erosion and deposition that creates these discontinuous wedges and lenses. This has strengths versus previous models in that it's an autogenic process. Um, it's constantly occurring, so we don't need changes in sea level or and progradation and backfilling. We also don't need to invoke changes in flow of magnitude in order to explain this erosion and deposition. So therefore, I'll, I'll conclude with a, a couple of questions and, and maybe an answer, which is, can Nick Point create these fundamental building blocks of channel fill, so these discontinuous wedges and lenses and, and the cut and fill packages? And it certainly seems like they're capable of doing so. And therefore, we can pose a question here of, are they effective at playing the role of those point bars and bar forms that we started with today, in that the headward erosion is effectively playing the role of erosion at the cut bank, and then the filling of the conduit afterwards is effectively playing the role of inner bend deposition. So I just want to thank uh, the sponsors of Chile Slope Systems for, for their for helping us along and, and funding this field work. And also a big thank you to everyone who's helped along the way um, from field work to, to data collection. And uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dan, for this, uh, for this presentation. Um, Questions in the question box. Uh, one one question that pops to my mind is whether, because the nick point, you're saying they play the role of um, of the point bars, but because the erosion and the deposition are basically aligned on the channel thalweg, I'm suddenly wondering whether that is also why fundamentally these examples are low sinuosity that you are displaying us. So there's a lack of a mechanism of lateral migration in the evolution so yeah <laughs> i don't know if there was a i don't know if that was more of a statement of a question but yeah it's definitely the case although we've seen um from martin's work that we definitely do get nick points that begin to cut into the outer outer bank so we can increase in your that way whether that dominates versus you know the outer bend erosion of the flows itself yeah. is a different question i guess so a question coming in from the audience by Adam McCarver. A nice presentation, Dan. Can you say anything about the type of sediment or fasces filling in the nick point deposits and, and any difference from non-nick point channel fills? Using the data I've shown there, um, because effectively we're looking at chron chronostigraphy, it's hard to actually pin down the actual facies. There are examples. Um, I, I can't remember the first name, but I think it's Hirima um, in sedimentology, published a paper last year, which talked about core deposits of these nick points, and they are dominated by sandstone here, in, or large parts of it dominated by structural sandstone here in, in Butte. And indeed, some of these chronostratigraphic surfaces that we pick out in these packages, because they are chronostratigraphic, if you put a core through them, they effectively just like structural sandstone. So we're not exactly picking out detailed stratigraphic surfaces. They are 
extant services, but whether they're stratigraphic or not is a, is a different question. But I think moving forward, yeah, we we want to call before and after flows to see how exactly link the deposit with how the nick point has migrated. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. So more thanks questions you. coming in, which you will be able to answer in the in the question boxes.